Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Allison Awardy, Commissioner with the Chicago Department of Public Health. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're here to take your questions on all things related to COVID-19. You can see we have a guest here today. Um, this is Charmaine Runis, and she is one of the mayoral fellows, meaning one of the graduate students who has been working for the city of Chicago this summer, and specifically on all things COVID. So she's been assigned to the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, and normally, you you are going into your second year of grad school at the University of Chicago in uh, computational analysis and public policy, which is an interesting combination. It sure is. Um, so uh, mainly you're going to help just uh, field questions from the audience, but tell folks just a little bit about some of what you've been doing with CDPH this summer. Sure. So my work at CDPH can be categorized in three different buckets. My program focuses a lot on data analysis, so I've been helping the epidemiology team understand comorbidity conditions of different patients by looking at medical records. I've also been looking at the data that comes through the Chicago data portal that really populates the COVID dashboard and trying to brainstorm ways to make that data just more understandable for the general public. And finally, I've also been creating social media content to make uh, CDPH resources just more accessible and understandable for folks. Perfect, thanks. Um, and so a lot of the people this summer have really been helping try to up our social media presence. Um, obviously, the Facebook Lives that we've been doing have been a piece of that, but if you've been paying attention, we have been trying to create quite a bit more content, um, even on our Facebook channel, uh, on Twitter, um, we've got the Instagram up and going again is my understanding. So encourage you to really check that out. We really try to put good, up-to-date data that is relevant to Chicago um, on our social media accounts. So today is Tuesday, August 11th. Let's check our social distancing first. Remind you that this is, of course, one of the easiest things that you can do. Um, were you thinking about how much distance you want to keep uh, between people and obviously be wearing face coverings when you are out and about. Let's take um, a quick look at the data. You can put questions into the box below or you can put the hashtag AskDrArwady on either Facebook or Twitter and we'll take them in live time and Charmaine will ask questions and if you've got some things that are data specific or relevant to what she was doing you can also put those in. So let's go to the dashboard, which you heard. She's been part of the team uh, working to really build the data behind this and make it more accessible. So have we got that up now? Perfect. So you can see on the dashboard overall here that our positivity rate, this is the test positivity rate, meaning the same way that the Illinois Department of Public Health is doing it to calculate across regions. We're up to 5.1%. A week ago, we were at 4.7%. So that continues to go up. We, of course, want to keep that ideally below 5%. Um, but it's not been surging up like it has in some other parts even of the state. So if you look uh, in southern Illinois, we've got some parts down there that are at 7%, even pushing 8% positivity. And there are 13 counties that the Illinois Department of Public Health has considered warning counties where the outbreak is really not in great control. There's a couple of indicators that are not doing well. Not, that is not Chicago. None of those are in northeastern Illinois. But the state overall does continue to see some increases in cases. If we look at our tests performed, we're doing 7,342 tests per day on average now, which is very high. Uh, that's up a little bit from where we were a week ago. And you can see on this graph, it's really been up and continuing to stay high. We want to be testing at least 4,500 a day. That's our minimum to be able to test 5% of Chicago's population every month. But particularly where we're seeing a percent positivity up in that 5% or over range, that's a setting where we want to even be doing additional testing. Um, the state considers if you're doing, if your percent positivity is under 8%, you're doing adequate testing, but we really like to try to keep that more at or under 5% if we can. So we're working on that. And then our tests, our, our cases overall, this of course is the main number that we're interested in. We're at 290 cases per day on average right now is our seven day rolling average. That had actually popped up over the weekend to just over 300. We were up to 305 was the highest that I saw. And then today is back down just a little bit again. It's basically flat from where we were a week ago. We were at 291 a week ago. Higher than we would like to be, but not seeing the major surges, again, that have been seen in some other settings. I'll remind you, you can come over here to the Daily by Demographic, and this is where you can explore the data 
uh, much more. If I reset it to the default here, this shows you again, our deaths are flat at three deaths per day as the average. Um, and then the people positivity is the other positivity, the one where we divide by the number of people positive as opposed to the test positive. And that's what we use for all of our subgroup analysis, whether that's race, ethnicity, whether that's zip code, just as we've been doing all along. Um, I'll show you here um, the death data in particular has been reassuring. It's been very low and flat here. If I take it into the last month or so here, if I run it for about the last month, you can see that really as of July 16, we've been flat there, um, really very low and staying, staying in a good spot there. Similarly, our hospitalization data continues to look really good. I'll just show you quickly. If you go to chicago.gov slash coronavirus, right up at the top here, this latest data tab is where you can look at much more detail. If you want to see more details about the reopening metrics, if you want to see the data portal itself, where you can pull the data and analyze it, if you want to see the latest mobility data. Uh, but the hospital capacity data is where you can see what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis here. So in the charts, for example, as of today, uh, we have 103 patients in Chicago hospitals who either have been diagnosed with COVID or are what we call a person under investigation for COVID, meaning that there's a test result pending. They have some presentation that may be consistent with COVID, but we don't have a result. And you can see broken down here, for example, of those 103 people, uh, 58 have been diagnosed with COVID, 45 we're waiting on a test result for. Similarly, in the non-ICU beds, 313 patients in non-ICU beds with either diagnosed or likely COVID, and you can see the breakdown here, that's 196, uh, where we're waiting on a test result, 117 with diagnosed COVID. And we have 35 people on ventilators. This is really down um, compared to where we were. 24 diagnosed with COVID, 11 where we're waiting a test result. And if you want to dive in here in some more detail, you can see what some of the graphs look like. This, for example, is the non-ICU beds. And th there are um, 313 occupied ICU beds. We have 2,400 available ICU beds, uh, non-ICU beds, sorry. And, um, and then uh, uh, a, a small number that are, that are related to, to COVID. So you can click here and see, sorry, here's the ICU. So 103 with occupied ICU beds, um, 667 that are occupied with non-IC, with non-COVID, um, and then remaining, you know, we've still got about 504 available. But you can see that this, this bottom part here, this dark blue, are the COVID numbers, and they've been down and staying down for all of our hospitalization numbers. So at this point, you know, we remain certainly concerned that our numbers are higher than we'd like them to be. We'd like that daily number not to be at 290 or close to 300. We'd like it to be back under 200 where we were a month or six weeks ago but on the plus side we've not seen major increases and we've not yet seen it hitting anything related to our hospital data or our deaths that can certainly lag um, particularly where we think about younger people having the potential to spread it to older people but even where we look at our case data back on the on the dashboard here if I bring this again just up to the last month or so, let's say, if I run this here, um, and we look at it by age, you can see that the red line here are our 18 to 29 year olds, still the highest case rate, but then this actually goes down in, in exactly the order of age. So we've got the highest case rates in 18 to 29 year olds, followed in light blue here by the 30 to 39 year olds, followed by the 40 to 49 year olds, followed by the 50 to 59 year olds, followed by the 60 to 69 year olds. The um, in pink here is 70 to 79 and gray is 80 plus. The only outlier are the kids, the zero to 17 year olds who continue to just have very low low case rates, more similar to what we see in our oldest folks. But everybody else, it runs right down like that. And that is, you know, if I had to make a choice, seeing more cases in younger people means there's less likelihood that we'll hit the health care system with it. But those younger folks absolutely still have the potential to have serious illness and then importantly can spread. So. All right. I think that's probably enough for data updates. Um, 
just to sort of what people are putting in questions, um, just what has surprised you about these last few months of working at the health department in this role? That's a great question. There is a lot going on at the Chicago Department of Public mm -hmm. Health. I didn't have a background in public health before starting this fellowship, and so when I realized that public health is not just the EPI team working furiously behind the scenes responding to COVID and trying to get the data out there, realizing that there are folks working on violence prevention, working on the environment, working on mental health, all of these initiatives that need to keep going <laughs> while folks respond to COVID as well. That has really surprised me, just the level of coordination. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point, right? We, we, we work hard to try to keep all of these other things going. You can't, you know, all of where we think about the indirect impacts of COVID especially, right. um, where I think about the mental health and the substance use and the violence mm -hmm. prevention work, so important right now in Chicago too. So great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so let's get into some questions potentially. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sounds good. So there have been a lot of questions lately about vaccines. Uh -huh. When might one be available? So can you just tell us what's the latest on a COVID vaccine? Yeah, absolutely. People may have seen in the news today that Russia is apparently moving ahead with some larger scale vaccinations even before the full trials are done. And I do want to differentiate that pretty carefully from what's happening here in the US and in most countries around the world. Every country makes its own decisions about regulating vaccines, about what data is required to know that a vaccine is safe and is effective before it will be approved for use. And so here in the US, the, um, the, the regulatory agencies have been very clear that we will require the same level of safety and efficacy trials that would be required for any other vaccine um, besides, you know, besides COVID. So at the moment, there are the WHO tracks all of the vaccine candidates that are under study, and there's close to 170. Most of those are still in what we call preclinical, meaning they're not even being tested in humans. They're still being studied in the lab or they're being studied in animals. And there's about 30 different vaccine candidates that have moved into some level of human testing around the world. And there's eight that have moved into phase three. Phase three are that sort of final level of testing um, before approval. Phase three are when you enroll thousands of people and at the most basic level, you give half the group the vaccine and you give half the group a placebo, meaning something that doesn't have vaccine in it. People are blinded, so they don't know which one they're getting. And then you follow the groups forward and see if the group that gets the vaccine is more protected against COVID. So it's basically saying, we know that it's worked in the labs, we know that it's worked in animals, we know that it's worked in a small number of people, does it work in the real world? So here, the Moderna vaccine is the one that's farthest along. That is a US based, it's the National Institutes of Health. And that's the vaccine that's, it's, it's using a new process. It's using, um, it, typically the way we used to make vaccines would be to take a strain of, of the coronavirus and then work to weaken it, basically make it so it's less strong. It takes a long time you grow, so that it's, it's not going to make someone sick, but you're still giving someone a weak or an inactivated form of the virus itself. Some of these new approaches like this one, um, and actually two of the leading candidates are instead using the messenger RNA, which is kind of like the recipe for how to make a protein. And so instead of injecting somebody with an inactivated or a weakened COVID vaccine, you just inject the recipe for somebody's cells to start making a protein that looks like the coronavirus. So you might have heard of this spike protein. Um, there's these little spikes that come out of the of coronavirus that are pretty unusual. Human cells don't have that. Most other viruses don't have that. And so the idea is if you can teach human cells to make some of these basically spike-like proteins, then if 
the real spike-like protein comes into the body, the body has seen it before and immediately amounts an immune response to it and the person doesn't get sick. So it's a different approach um, and there's some still lots happening in terms of figuring out not just will this work, but what will it, would it look like to distribute it. So there's a couple that are, that are moving well there. There's one um, out of Oxford that's got a lot of promise that's more in a, in, in a, a different kind of um, like not, it's using a different kind of virus that is harmless. Uh, and again, you sort of teach it to recognize the coronavirus. And then there's, a, there's about four that are out of China and um, all are moving ahead. So we'll see what happens with this Russia one, but I want folks to really understand that different from that, we will not approve anything here until we know that it's been proven to be safe and effective. Great, thank you for, for walking us through that. That's sure. a lot of information and um, yeah, if folks have more questions about it, please feel free to put those in the chat, uh, but we will take the next one. So Faye State from Facebook writes, I've read about monoclonal antibodies being uh -huh. used to treat people who were exposed to COVID-19, but not yet sick or not hospitalized. Are they being used in the Chicago area? Oh yeah, good question. So monoclonal antibodies are so antibodies are, again, we've heard this term a lot. That's when, you, when your body makes an immune response to COVID or to any infection, your body produces antibodies. Um, and that is what sort of helps fight off the infection at the most basic level. So that's why when we talk about antibody testing, you're testing to see does your body, has your body, has your immune system seen this vaccine before and created these antibodies? So the idea of monoclonal antibodies is that instead of, for example, taking the antibodies in the plasma, we've talked about people who, who donating plasma who have these antibodies and we, and we give them the antibodies that have been made in another person. This is the idea of synthetically creating antibodies like in the laboratory as a medication. So it's, a, it's something that certainly has promise. It tends to be quite expensive, but it's been used um, for some treatment. And then as she notes, starting to be used a little bit in a preventive kind of way. Clinicaltrials.gov, if you're really interested in this kind of stuff, is where you can find out the latest for what is happening related to whether these are being studied in any real way and then whether they're being studied here in Chicago. So I know for monoclonal antibodies, for example, there's two big trials that are, that are I think one is already enrolling and one is going to be enrolling that are again, in a randomized, controlled, placebo, double-blind, the real way to answer, do these work? Um, there's one that's enrolling now. I don't know that it's enrolling in Chicago, but then there's gonna be one actually for nursing home residents. Again, where we think about a high-risk group where there would be reason, again, with consent to potentially trial this uh, and follow it up. And that one uh, I know is in clinicaltrials.gov and will be enrolling in some of the nursing homes actually here in Chicago. So you can look that up if, if you're interested. If somebody is very sick, there is the opportunity for doctors in Chicago and anywhere to um, be able to use some of these medications for kind of a trial on an individual, but especially for a preventive kind of way, we want to do that in a systematic way to answer the questions of whether this works. So, um, so I hope that helps answer the question. Great. The next question is from Kristen Krakowski, also from Facebook. Can an asymptomatic person donate plasma okay. to help? All right, yeah, um, so absolutely. So right, so the, the whole idea of donating plasma is exactly that. So as opposed to the monoclonal antibodies are a drug company working to synthetically create the antibodies. The idea of the antibodies in plasma is that you yourself have fought off COVID and you've built this immune response. And again, there are trials going on uh, as well as some, some use for people who are very ill. And it's one of the things the jury is still out on. There's been some, certainly it's one of the oldest things that we do in infectious diseases to try to treat people who are seriously ill. But for people who have, who have been diagnosed with COVID, importantly, so you, you, can, you, can, you can donate just through the Red Cross, actually. You go to AmericanRedCross.org um, and you can sign up to give blood. You can also sign up to give plasma. They're going to be interested in people who are asymptomatic 
but who recovered from COVID. So if you've never had symptoms from COVID, you're not who they're looking for for antibodies. They're looking for people who were diagnosed with COVID and probably from an antibody perspective, honestly, people tend to mount more of an antibody response if they've been sicker. So um, certainly if you are one of the more than 50,000 people who have recovered from COVID here in Chicago uh, and, you've been, and you were diagnosed at the time, you can go to, to uh, online to the Red Cross and put in your information and they'll be in touch with you about potentially donating plasma. Uh, if you've not had COVID, the Red Cross still needs blood. So I would really encourage you know, anybody who's interested in being helpful broadly um, to, to reach out and think about donating blood or plasma. Great, that's super helpful. Uh, next question is from Sandy Gordon. If someone is smoking and we inhale their secondhand smoke, uh -huh. Is the virus transmittable that way? So oh. do droplets travel with expelling smoke? Okay, yeah. So COVID does not travel with smoke per se. So it's not that the when someone is breathing out smoke, the COVID will like hitch a ride on their smoke. So the smoke itself is not a concern. That said, if you're near enough to somebody that you're potentially sort of smelling their smoke by definition when they're smoking or they're vaping they don't have a mask on right, right. and they are blowing out smoke and in that if they were covid infected there is some potential as they're sort of blowing out the smoke that there could be um, some covid there so i wouldn't be like super worried oh my goodness i smell smoke and that smoke has itself carried covid because we know odors actually travel generally more than covid was but if you're if you are near somebody who's smoking, they don't have a mask on by definition. And I think if you're picking up secondhand smoke, that's a good sign to move away from somebody um, or to ask them to move away, depending on the setting. We, of course, in many of our indoor settings uh, and even near entrances, people are not allowed to be smoking uh, for the other risks of secondhand smoke. So COVID itself, not gonna hit you right on smoke, but if you're near enough that you're smelling secondhand smoke, some more concern that you're starting to get into the into the area around around someone who could potentially have covid again the main risk factor for covid remains being within that six foot distance at least 10 to 15 minutes so i don't want you to think i caught one whiff of smoke oh i have to be you know immediately very worried but it could be just a trigger perhaps moving away and keeping a distance is a good idea right and speaking of distances we have a question about the latest on air travel. So this is from Meg Shoemaker Ainley. What is the latest on air travel? Is it safe? <laughs> okay, so anybody who's been watching this all along knows that I will never, never answer the question, is it safe? Because there's no such thing as a yes, no, is it safe, is it not? Uh, for any interaction that involves any interact, you know, any time you're interacting with another person, inherently there is some level of risk. What I would say related to air travel is that airplanes themselves actually are not one of the very highest risk settings, to be perfectly honest. Um, we know this because we, for years and years and years, have done a lot of following people who have infectious diseases and ride on airplanes. And so there are some diseases, um, like measles, that can be very easily transmissible in the air that we have more concern for spread throughout a plane. Generally for COVID, we would have concern for people who are sitting, you know, within six feet, you know, sitting next to someone or probably in the row or maybe two rows. There are actually, if someone's interested, you can go on the CDC website and there's guidance about how far around is, is of concern. But the bottom line is you need to wear your mask. Everybody needs to wear your mask. Like if you are going on an airplane, that is a time to be very careful with mask wearing, to be very careful with hand hygiene, um, and as much as possible to try to be keeping distance. I know there are some airlines that were keeping middle seats open. I think we may see less of that um, as, as things are moving. And then the other thing is it's not just the plane um, because the air circulation in planes is actually very good. There's a lot of filters. Like it's, it's, it's not one of my highest concern areas at all when it comes to the, the actual air transmission, even though people tend to be concerned about it. But you're also move it, you know, think about the lines as you're getting on and off planes and you're waiting in security lines and you're moving through airports. There is a lot of potential for 
close interactions with others. So if you are going to travel by air, um, I, I think it's acceptable broadly, um, unless you know if you have a high risk condition or you're in that older group, I still would just not recommend it at this time. But for somebody who is in a regular risk, um, and again, you're going to have to make those decisions because there may be reasons that you need to travel that that risk becomes, you know, you're, you're going to have to do that risk benefit. Um, but I'd say if you're going to travel, absolutely wear the mask and be very conscious of keeping the distance as much as you can. If you have an opportunity to select a seat, try to sit, you know, further away from people uh, either next to you um, or behind you. And primarily, I think we see more COVID spread in settings where people are not thinking about the risk of COVID than in the ones that they are. And I think people think about it the most on airplanes. So I don't think it's probably one of the very highest risk activities. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from Maria Lopez from Facebook. I had my mother-in-law staying with me for two weeks. She was positive with COVID-19. Yeah. I got tested three times. It came out negative. My family and friends can't believe it. <laughs> so what do you think about that, Dr. Arwady? Yeah, that's, that's good. That makes me happy to hear that. So I think this is an, inter you know, it's an interesting question because I think people tend to assume that any interaction with someone with COVID will automatically result in an infection. And that, that's actually not true. Mm -hmm. Where we look at the data still on average without any kind of um, mitigation in place, without masks, without social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, right at the beginning, on average, somebody with COVID was spreading to two to three other people. Um, again, different from some of the other diseases, which are very, very infectious, right? Measles, people spread on an average to like 18 other people. Wow. So this one is infectious, but for most people, it doesn't seem to be so necessarily widespread. That said, there are examples of some of these more super spreader type events, and that's been a real concern. And there's been a lot of research to understand, is there something genetically different about that person? Does it have, some of it certainly has to do with the timing of when and the activities they're doing. We know people can transmit disease before they have symptoms. Um, and so particularly where early on, before there was a lot of mask wearing, we saw people without any symptoms out and you know going about their activities potentially with a lot of spread. And there still are questions about why some people just seem to spread it a lot more than others do. But most people still, on average, are not spreading to very many people. We talk sometimes about this, this R naught. Um, it's, it's an epidemiologic term of basically, the, it's called the reproductive number. It's basically how, this, this question, how many people is somebody transmitting to? And so if you have an R naught of one, it means that every one person is transmitting to one other person and your outbreak will stay flat. So literally, like we have 290 cases right now, every day in Chicago. If our R naught were at one, we would stay at 290 cases forever. One case would transmit to one case would transmit to one case. For our numbers to go down, we actually, as a society, need to transmit on average to less than one person, meaning that more people need to transmit to nobody. Does that make sense? Yeah. Even if you've got a few people who are transmitting to more folks. Um, and when we're seeing really significant rise, like people sometimes ask, what makes an outbreak out of control? What are you concerned? One of the things I'm most worried about is the slope of that line. We can tolerate slight increases, slight decreases, but if we start to see that really steep increase, like we were seeing at the beginning here, where we were seeing our double, you know, th numbers doubling every two to three days, that means that your, your reproductive number has gotten very high and you're seeing a lot of transmission. The best way to keep that number down is to have fewer interactions with other people and fewer interactions that put you at risk for COVID. So certainly a lockdown is one way to do that. Uh, you know, the number one risk factor for having, whether an outbreak is in control or not, is the number of contacts that somebody has. So um, we were able to see early on in some of the Asian countries that when when we went from an average of 18 contacts per day down to two contacts per day, that got rid of the outbreak, mm. right? Here, when we're in this place where we're, we're 
we're open as a society with some restrictions in place. Still, we really want people to think about who and how many people are you interacting with, especially without a mask, especially without keeping the six foot distance. We want your bubble to be small. Probably people within your household like this are the folks who you're at highest risk from. So the fact that you didn't have spread is great. It's not completely unexpected. I do, of course, I don't know from this question, you know, whether your mother-in-law knew that she had COVID at the time. If she did, hopefully you were doing things like hand washing and ideally sleeping in separate rooms. Ideally, we even have separate bathrooms. It is, you know, wearing masks inside. These are things that can protect even within a household. Uh, and it's important that people know that just because someone has COVID, it's not 100% that everybody around them will get COVID. Certainly in a household setting where you may be more likely to be within six feet, that, that risk would be higher. But, you know, if you were generally keeping your distance from your mother-in-law, uh, and washing hands, it doesn't actually surprise me that we didn't see significant spread there. So good job uh, within the family. I'm glad you got those multiple tests. That would certainly be a high risk exposure. And so we want people, it sounds like you were quarantining appropriately, got the testing um, and, and, and we're not infected. And, th and that's good. That's really what we want to see. We want to see ideally every one person spreading to zero people. That's how we get on top of this outbreak. Yeah. And I think y your point about contacts is a great segue to our next question, mm -hmm. which is from Tiffany Hagstrom. Do you have any statistics from the contact tracers, i.e. a certain percent from family gatherings, oh, yeah. percent from restaurants and bars, percent from large gatherings? What can you say about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, great question. So again, every case in Chicago, we do case investigation and then contact tracing on. We still have people who are not picking up the phone or are not wanting to engage with us. So we don't have data on 100% of the cases. I just want folks to understand that. And maybe a little later, if people have questions, we can talk about some of the strategies we're working on there. But for all of the people for whom we are able to complete interviews, we ask all these questions. We ask you know, lots of details about when did symptoms start, if symptoms started, you know, who is at home, where do people work, uh, where were people during the time that they were potentially infectious, starting a couple of days before symptoms started, or we have another protocol if they don't have symptoms, up until the time that they've been diagnosed. What have they done around quarantine isolation? And we keep all of these lists. And so basically, you know, first of all, we're always comparing um, and doing some statistical work to sort of see, are there clusters that are emerging anywhere? So if we've got, you know, three, four, five people within a day or two all saying, you know, I was at this location, that triggers for us an investigation into that location. If someone is in a high risk setting, like a long term care facility or jail, obviously that triggers another type of investigation. Workplaces, yet another one. Schools, yet another one. But the biggest change that we have seen uh, in our actual contact tracing data has to do with where we're now seeing cases. So when we go back to May, April, uh, about a third of our cases were being seen in what we called outbreak settings, meaning they were being associated with a particular location, a long-term care, a workplace, a um, jail, homeless shelter, tied to a location that the health department could then go to this location, figure out what's going on, work with folks, make sure better safety things are in place, know who has been at risk, test other employees, test other long-term care facilities, really get on top of these settings. The difference now is that only about like five to six percent of our cases are in these kinds of settings. Like, almost none. And that's been true in June and July. We are much better now at keeping COVID in control in these higher risk settings. We're not broadly seeing big outbreaks in uh, restaurants, in workplaces, in the jail, in the long-term care. We continue to see some cases, don't get me wrong, but the amount of spread that we're seeing is really not very significant. And instead, where we're seeing cases are people just reporting these social interactions and spread within the household, to the prior point. So about a third of our cases are exposed to someone with COVID who lives in their household. Like that is driving a full one third of our new cases right now. And we know that's the highest risk setting because people are leaving the household to go to work, to socialize, to meet with the neighbors, to see the extended family. 
and unfortunately bringing COVID back. And so the, our very outbreak has changed in this respect. We ask about large gatherings. We ask about locations. Like we really do a full assessment of where people have been, but it's been much less tied to individual locations and much more to the fact that I think people have just expanded their social circles and they're maybe not taking as many precautions as they were early on. So again, just asking everybody to limit your exposures, especially without a mask, especially without keeping that six foot distance. Probably within your household, you'll, you'll, those will be your people in your bubble. And you shouldn't be letting a whole lot of other people in unless you're being really careful, especially if you've got anybody who's um, older, over 60 or with underlying conditions. Right. We have a follow up question from Lauren Eliza. If someone in a household is exposed to the coronavirus, should the rest of the family observe quarantine or go about normal activity? All right. So this a little bit has to do with whether the person has been diagnosed. Uh, so broadly speaking, we don't sort of quarantine, 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 quarantine. This is a question I get a lot where, um, you know, my son's tutor's daughter was has been diagnosed with COVID. Like, do I need to quarantine sort of four generations removed? And generally speaking, no, it would depend a little bit, I think, on the situation. So ideally, if someone in that household has been exposed and like in a real way, right? Like they've been, um, they've been within six feet, they've, they've not had the mask on, they've been called by a contact tracer, there's a real concern there. They need to get tested like right away. And I think depending on the situation, if it's possible for the household to, you know, to self quarantine, you know, for a day or two while that test is coming back, so much the better. The requirement for quarantine becomes when you are actually exposed to someone who is known to have COVID. So if that person in your family is diagnosed with COVID, there is then a requirement um, for quarantine. So the, our contact tracers are very good at working with families around the given situations. And some of this is an is a individual decision, but we want people to get tested is the bottom line. You don't need to quarantine because somebody four removed from you, uh, you know, has been diagnosed. But once we're getting into one to two removed, depending a little bit on the job and whether you have any, if you're exposing people who are at high risk, et cetera. Um, but once someone in your household has been diagnosed, everybody in the household quarantines for the 14 days. And similarly, once you know anybody who's been within that within that um, within that that has had a real exposure, meaning within 10 to 15 minutes uh, with a six foot distance or any other time the health department is letting you know that you've had a significant exposure. So I hope that helps clarify it. I think so. Yeah. Uh, we have another question about contact tracing okay. from Anna Shaposchnik. If I get a call from a contact tracer, how would I recognize it's the city of Chicago oh, and not yeah. a telemarketer? I yeah. don't usually answer calls if I don't recognize the number. Anna, I'm I'm with you there. Yeah, absolutely. So great question. And this is something, this is an example of one of the things we've really been working on behind the scenes at CDPH. So we have been building a brand new data system around contact tracing. So we've been using our traditional case investigation contact tracing software that we have used for many years. But with COVID, there are a number of things, just the volume is really high. And as we're pulling in a lot of community-based contact tracers and clinical contact tracers, we needed a more robust system that was very user-friendly and would allow very secure data um, as well as transfer where it was needed. And as part of that platform, we're working exactly on these kinds of issues. So we're expecting this new platform to go live hopefully next week. It's very close. It's in the final stages of user testing. And when we move to that platform, we will be moving to a single number that all of these calls will be coming from. So it's going to be um, 31274 COVID. Uh, and that'll be the number. Once it's live, we will be doing some public service announcements around this and really making this part of the messaging so that to exactly to this point, people know who we are. In the meantime, if you ever have a question, we had a contact tracer on last week um, who talked a little bit about this, but you can always, um, 
call back the health department to make sure that you know it's not a scam also we would never ask for things like social security number uh, and we're always happy to basically ha you know figure out a way to make sure that you're confident in the data that's being shared we're also working on text messaging capabilities recognize younger people in particular we're learning are often not very interested in talking on the phone um, and so building up some other ways that people can share data in ways that is secure but they feel comfortable with so it's an example of some of the, the behind the scenes work that we've been doing to try to build up our data systems with your help um, and, uh, and, and make this more user friendly. So stay tuned. Again, hoping this, this software will be live in the next week and then we'll be rolling it out shortly thereafter. All right, fingers crossed for yep. that platform. Our next question comes from Jamila Ford Edwards. My cousin had a negative antibody test in April, although he had symptoms, mm -hmm. but a positive antibody test in June. Mm -hmm. Which test is accurate? Okay, great. So again, the antibody test, as a reminder, that's the blood test. That's the one that's just looking to see if you had an immune response to COVID. And so again, not knowing all the details, but if someone had symptoms, there's the diagnostic test, the nose test or the mouse test that they would get then and would probably be diagnosed. If you try to get an antibody test, meaning that blood test, while you're having symptoms, it probably will be negative because it takes some time for that immune response to actually develop. So my guess would be if your cousin was having symptoms in August and tried to get an antibody test in August, it was too soon for the body to have actually built up that antibody response. It takes some weeks for that to happen. And instead, in June, when he went or she went and got the test and at that point saw positive antibodies, I would trust that that antibody test is probably correct um, based on an infection in April, if I had to take a guess not knowing the details. Yeah, that's helpful. So more people are moving outside just because they feel safer doing so. And we have a question about bugs outside. So okay. Jonathan Max from Facebook. Do mosquitoes or flies transmit the disease? Yeah. They do not. We've answered this question a lot of times, um, but it certainly is something people are concerned about in the summer. No concern for mosquitoes, no concern for flies, no concern for ticks transmitting COVID. That said, it is West Nile virus season in Chicago, uh, which is transmitted by mosquitoes. So we do want you to wear your bug spray and take all the appropriate precautions, get rid of your standing water, uh, but that is not for COVID. Um, all right, I think we are probably just about at time. Thank right. you very much for stepping in and reading questions and again, for all the work uh, and help that really that you've been giving us over this summer. I really appreciate it. We've had a number of students and people really step up and help out in all kinds of new ways and it's, it's been great having you. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's finish with some, some good news, which is how we usually like to finish off. So first of all, um, some really good news from our travel order standpoint. So I'll remind you that the city of Chicago has this quarantine requirement where people are traveling to states where the outbreak is really in poor control, meaning having more than 15 cases per day per 100,000 population. And I'm happy to say that as of today, we are not adding any states. And in fact, three states are coming off the list because they've had two weeks in a row now where they've managed to get the outbreak back down and keep it down. So Kansas, Utah, and Iowa are all coming off the list. And also good news, both Wisconsin and Nebraska are under that 15 mark for the first time this week. If they can maintain that progress through another week, Wisconsin and Nebraska may be able to come off next week. So really happy to hear that, particularly Wisconsin. I know that this remains um, of particular concern for a lot of Chicagoans. And just as a reminder, anyone who is commuting to and from Wisconsin for work and school is not subject to that mandatory self-quarantine, but does need to limit activities. You can read about it online. But the bottom line is that overall, the, the US is finally seeing some real declines here. We're down about 18% for new cases compared to where we were a couple weeks ago, which is a real drop. 
Um, California is getting some better numbers. Like we're seeing real progress, even in places where the numbers are still pretty high, they are starting to come down nicely. Deaths are also just starting to decline. They tend to lag, so we've been seeing some surges there. So across the country, starting to get a handle on this, but we're over 5 million cases. We have a very long way to go, and we've not yet seen that turnaround in Illinois. So we really need folks here to double down. But this is good news um, around uh, the travel order. And then I also just wanted to highlight that Chicago Parks District is going to be hosting drive-in movies on Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout all of August. So the events are free. You do need to pre-register though. So go to chicagoparkdistrict.com slash movies and consider checking out a drive-in movie uh, through Parks District. So that was another nice example of shifting some summer programming. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight that as a key pillar of the anti-poverty agenda, uh, Mayor Lightfoot this week launched the Your Home is Someone's Workplace campaign. And if people did not see that, I encourage you to take a look. There's, there's things on the website, things on Facebook. It's really recognizing that people who are working in others' homes, um, whether these are house cleaners or nannies or home health care aides, they are working professionals um, and there are things that they are deserving of and we want to really make sure that we are supporting that as a city. And so this is really a call to action to employers of these kinds of workers to make sure you're paying a fair living wage, you're providing paid time off, that there are written expectations that are clear and agreed on and that you have safe workplaces. So go ahead and check out chai.gov slash care if you want to learn some more about this, um, I think it's a really important initiative as we think about essential workers, right? This term has come to mean something new and different in the time of COVID. And a lot of these folks tend to be making some of the lower wages, but working the most. And I think it's appropriate to really think about what are we doing as a city and as employers, if you've got folks living in your home, I mean, working in your home, um, to do, do right by people who keep all of our homes running. So with that, um, thank you very much for joining. Um, thank you again to Charmaine Runis, who is one of the Mayoral Fellows uh, student at the University of Chicago, who's been helping CDPH with our uh, COVID response this summer. Uh, we will be back on Thursday with Sybil Madison to take some more of your questions at 11 a.m. In the meantime, have a good week. Please keep doing the things that we know work. Keep your number of contacts down. If you don't need to interact with someone, maybe now's not the best time. You know, now's a good time to not have an interaction you don't need to have. If you are, wear that face covering, keep your distance, wash your hands, protect vulnerable Chicagoans. I'd like to be able to start seeing those numbers not just flatten, but ideally come back down. Um, we can do it. And with that, I'll ask you to be safe, Chicago, and we'll see you on Thursday.